Hey, there we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time it might be where you are out there. Welcome back to the live stream. This is Learn C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. That's me. How you doing there, friends? My name is Jeff Fritz. And today we're going to learn a lot more about Blazor. We're going to be writing some code together. We're going to be answering your questions, talking through some of the cool things that are going on out there for web developers that want to build with .NET. You want to learn C Sharp. You want to get in and you want to build something cool that runs on a server, that runs on a browser, or even runs on a mobile application. But today, today we're going to be talking about managing component interactions, not just parameters. Excuse me. But we're also going to talk about cascading parameters. We're going to talk about managing events between components. And we're going to get a little bit into state management. How you doing out there? We got friends connected from YouTube. We got friends connected from Twitch. Let me bring in let me bring in the folks here. Where's the button? It's it's there they are. 40 minutes of open QA AMA mode starting now. There's the timer. How you doing? It if you're watching the recording out there, we're gonna put we're going to put timestamps on the recording so that you can scroll through and get right to your favorite part of this. I hope you enjoy this archive of a live stream here. I'm going to say hello to Diego from Argentina. How many sessions am I going to give about Blazor, Diego asks. Um, I'm targeting about six. And uh, I'll probably run the full .NET uh, architect, uh, Blazor workshop over on Twitch at the end of that. MOBA420, oh, I'm glad you enjoy it. I think this is cool. Uh, Levi CC 00123 good time zone to you. Chris Jones is here on Twitch. Gameplay, hello, hello. Cobra Ashley, nah, it wasn't the audio out of balance. It was actually, I had audio coming in from, um, it, it was echoing back through from my mod view and from YouTube view. Uh, got that ironed out now. Things are going well with that should be sounding much better and in just this guy's voice here how you doing there omar good to see you hat nice good morning ergon rod good morning to you uh yeah let's go hang on let's say that right for for omar there on youtube let's go that'll be fun Claber, how you doing there c sharp developers uh balint Sup, good to see you. Uh, GB in France saying Blazor is amazing. Thank you so much. You, you feel bad? You missed the last two streams? That's okay. It's all archived and over on the YouTube channel. YouTube.com slash dot net. Look for the Learn C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz uh, playlist. You can find everything right there. How you doing there? Trombone NL says, oh, oh my gosh. My favorite teacher is so kind. Thank you. I'm, I'm all broken up now. <laughs> I appreciate the kind words. I really do. Um, that it it means a lot to me that that you get something out of these sessions together, um, learning, finding something new that's going to help your career, that's going to get you into that next level of development. Your project's going to be successful. You're going to build something that's going to help. That's going to help other folks. That's what's important to me. That's what I want to see come out of this. And uh, when folks can can share not just kind words, hey, you know, it's great to see. I really enjoy watching your streams. But when you share, hey, you know what? We shipped this website. We we built this thing with .NET, I, and it works great. Thank you for for in, in inspiring or showing me this technique that that I was able to use, and it and it made it better. Awesome stuff. Really great to see. Is it uh, Shabwiz? Uh, hello to you in Nigeria. Are we getting a sas session on deploying Blazor? Yeah, we could probably do that before we get to the end of this. Yeah. Ricardo is here from Monterey, Mexico. Good to see you, Ricardo. Thank you for tuning in. Darren, faster after 50. You're a PHP developer, but this stuff looks interesting. Fantastic. Check it out. If you're a PHP developer and you want to learn more about .NET, there's also a great bridge technology that you can use that'll help you take your PHP code and use it with .NET. Check out peachpy.io. It's a compiler. It's an interpreter and compiler that will take your PHP code and allow it to run in a .NET runtime. And it goes the, the other way also. Not only can your PHP, can, I'm sorry, not only can your PHP code run in .NET, but you can, from PHP, call into .NET components as well. 
Really cool stuff. Check it out, peachpie.io. Um, how you doing there, Andy? Good afternoon to you. Uh, or she is here on Twitch. Hello, hello. Good to see you. V Vishal Coder. .net is always scary for you. I can help you with that. Let's let's de scary. Let let's make this a little bit easier for folks to get into, get interested in, be excited about. You should you shouldn't be scared by .net. We want to make sure that it's something you enjoy, you're enthusiastic about. Let me know your questions. We've got a. a bunch of time allocated here that we're going to chat. We'll talk things through. I don't want to go too far off topic, but I'm happy to answer your questions. And when we get into the lesson, I'm happy to answer your questions as we go through the various steps of what we're going to be learning today. Um, let me see here. Uh, Carrie D. Fluffy, good, D. Luffy, I'm sorry. Good to see you with the .NET point emotes there. Shara Fudin, good evening to you. Drox, good afternoon on Twitch. Gentile, uh, you're really into this subject. Sadly, your company, not that much. That's okay. Um, folks are coming around. They're learning about it. They're, they're seeing what we've built with Blazor, and, and it's, it's growing quickly. Might not be into it right now, but at some point they will. Didn't know there was a YouTube channel? Yeah, yeah, Levi, there is. Uh, Banu uh, says, hi, I like Blazer, very easy to use. Terrific, there you go, Banu likes that. Uh, Mir Hussein Abrar, hello to you in India. It's Mike on Twitch, good afternoon to you. Lil Nougat, hello to you in Peru, over there on Twitch. Uh, yeah, Drox, I agree, don't be scared of .net. We can make this, we, we can work this out. And you know what? Not everybody's going to like every technology. Hopefully you do, but... Let's check it out. Let's walk through it. Let's talk through those things you might have concerns with. How you doing there, Basal? Good to see you over there on Twitch. Sharafuddin, can I explain about cascading parameter? Simple and easy to implement use cases. We're going to be doing that today. That's on the docket. That is a sample I have ready for you today. G. Elegist, uh, just finished an internship as a .NET developer. Now you got the job. We got to celebrate that. We got to celebrate that. Finish an internship. Got the job. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Hello, Akeem in Nigeria. Um, you deployed your first Blazor server app and love it. Look at this. We got to applaud and love that. You want to learn more? Let's do it. Let's do it. It's difficult to convince big enterprises. Um, it, they want to see They want to see a little bit of a track record. Oh, where else is this being used? Uh, hey, is there, you know, what, um, not just where else is this being used, but what can, what does support look like? Who can I call and get help with this? And we have answers for all those things over on the blazer.net website. So there are answers out there for those folks. And certainly if, if folks are Microsoft customers, um, there are local field people that can help you out with those questions and get you, get you moving and excited about the technology. TG on YouTube is here. Uh, Blazor's come out for two years, but it looks like uh, Microsoft actively promoted last year before .NET 6 came out. Could I give a brief history about Blazor? So Blazor has been a product, has been a fully supported product since .NET 3. It was available as part of, um, it was available server side, fully supported with .NET Core 3. That was, I want to say, 2019. 20, uh, yeah, 2019, that was released. They weren't quite ready with Blazor WebAssembly. There were some things they had to fix, tune, make sure that it worked better. And Blazor for WebAssembly was released in spring 2020. Um, and it was available as an, kind of an add-on to .NET Core 3.1. Um, .NET 5 came out, and it, was, it, and it was updated. It was patched with .NET 6. Both Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly have been upgraded, patched, performance improved, and are available with long-term support now. So you get at least three years support on Blazor from fully from Microsoft folks. All the sources open out there available for you on GitHub. You can check it out. Um, lots to see around it. Lots of excitement. There's investment going in to make sure that there's cool new features, better performance improvements, coming with .NET 7, which is scheduled to be delivered in November 2022. Um, and there'll be, there will be another long-term support version of .NET in November 2023, and that will be .NET 
8. That schedule is set in stone. That is how it will be developed, deployed, and uh, yeah, it will grow at least over the next two years is what we're seeing. Uh, Holy Crow on YouTube. Nice screen name. Recently started learning C Sharp. It's a steep learning curve. Uh, let's work on that. How, how are you seeing it as a steep learning curve? What can we do to, to improve things there? Excited to learn. Fantastic. Emmanuel is here from Germany. Omar with a big applause. Uh, yeah, big congratulations and encouraging to the folks that, like, like our friend G. Elegast here, who are, are seeing, seeing benefits from rolling out new .NET applications, Blazor applications in your organizations. Hello to you, Angelo in the Philippines. So good to see everybody. My goodness. Um, did, did something happen? The chat, the chat stop. Um, I'm not used to this. Um, yeah, it looks like, uh, it looks like, tw uh, looks like Restream stopped, uh, bringing in Twitch chat. Um, I'm going to roll over to Twitch. It's not appearing here, but there's a number of comments over there on Twitch. Um, <laughs> Um, Arshia asks, can we monitor and transfer data from apps like Discord to a .NET app? Absolutely. Um, in fact, we, we did the Discord bot demo a couple weeks ago, um, where we showed how you can connect up to Discord, listen for messages, and interact with them on a .NET application. So, yes, you absolutely can do that. Um, uh, da -da 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 -da. sometimes Microsoft documentation... Uh, are really, really technical. Just ta check out some other devs that explain it a little simpler. Check out, hang on. So part of what, what my team does is make more consumable information like this stream, other videos out there that you can find on the .NET channel over on YouTube. Check out youtube.com slash .NET. We have a bunch of uh, video series for beginners. You can tune in and check. Check out learnmicrosoft.com. We wrote a number of courses there that are self-paced tutorials that you can walk through and learn. Um, additionally, when you go to .NET website, there is a learn button up at the top. You can click through there and um, there's a bunch of videos um, and, and other uh, tutorials, materials, blog posts that'll get you there and, and help, uh, help you learn better. Depending on how you learn, there's all kinds of different ways that'll get you successful. OG on Twitch asks, "Am I able? To, are we able to put 3D objects from Blender to Blazor like the way they do with 3JS?" Um, I haven't tried it. You should be able to do it because um, Blazor interacts with the DOM just like just like 3JS does. So you should absolutely be able to do it. It's not something that I've personally done. Crafty Becky with a bunch of hype here. Um, good to see you. Let me, I'm going to try and refresh my, my restream chat. It's like it's not connected and pulling in messages from Twitch. Uh, let me see this. Am I getting that to appear? Nope. Nope. Looks like restream is not behaving. Um, we'll work on that. Well, well, we won't work on that. We'll see if it comes back. Uh, Drox writes, I read that Blazor also would work for desktop. That's coming as part of .NET MAUI. You can build, take your Blazor content, drop it into a .NET MAUI application, and rebuild it for, um, for a native application running on Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. Uh, you're in the WinForms camp. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. So... Yeah, uh, Restream looks like it's taking a powder here for me. Hello to you, Nestor in Colombia. Good to see you. Sharif Houdin very much loves Blazor to implement an enterprise system. Can I kickstart with Octane Framework? Yeah, you can absolutely do that. If that helps you, if starting with a framework like Octane is something that you're familiar with, it's something that you're comfortable with, go for it. Absolutely. Fluxor helped you stay sane when building Blazor style? That's, that's terrific. Hey. There's all kinds of community work and, and frameworks out there that are being built and growing. Absolutely want to see uh, folks successful with those. So how you doing there, Kushal? Roy is here from Malaysia. Daniel, how does Blazor scale as number of users increases? Well, if you're using Blazor for WebAssembly, it scales the same way 
that a a typical JavaScript based single page application does. You've deployed everything to the browsers, so each browser runs the code itself, and then your server content needs to manage and and be able to handle the API calls from those. So it scales very 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 well for that. Um, I use Azure Functions in a couple applications for doing that because Azure Functions will uh, dynamically allocate more um, more processors, more processes to manage those interactions as more pressure comes into the Functions application. So that I think is very good way to do to interact with that. Um, some more questions coming in from YouTube. Uh, will there be Office add-ins with Blazor? Don't know. Going to have to ask the Office folks. That's up to them. Kushal asks, can Blazor replace React? Sure. Uh, Blazor is another front-end user, user interface framework. Can certainly replace, uh, can be used in place of React, Angular, Vue, vanilla JavaScript, what have you. Um, and for folks that build with C Sharp, folks that enjoy writing .NET based applications, you're going to have that that same experience that that JavaScript developers prefer, where they have the same front end technology using JavaScript and back end technology, that back office technology running on Node. So you have JavaScript in both places. When you work with Blazor, you end up with C Sharp in the front in in the front office application in your user interface, and you have it in the back office running on the server to manage interactions and things. Really good stuff. Claudio on YouTube says, Hey Jeff, another awesome Monday live. Could you explain more how WebAssembly works runs in the browser? Um, yes. So uh, briefly, and, and there's documents on the website. I'm going to get some music playing here in the background while I get this, uh, get this running. This is, yeah, let's play the Synthwave playlist from Stream Beats. And uh, I'll start way down here. This is music that's royalty-free, DMCA-free. You can listen to it wherever you'd like. There's a bunch of different genres, and I like the little bit of techno genre here in the background. Check it out at streambeats.com. There's playlists for Apple Music, Amazon Music, and Spotify, like I'm listening to here today. Thank you so much to Harris Heller for making this music available for us to listen to. So when the, the to the question of how does Blazor WebAssembly work, there is inside every browser, because every browser has been upgraded to support HTML5 because of the Spectre and Meltdown bugs that we had many, many years ago now. Three, four years ago now. So your browser has been updated. It supports HTML5. One of the components of HTML5 is a technology called WebAssembly. WebAssembly allows your browser to run natively compiled code directly. So, Blazor WebAssembly is a version of Blazor, is a version of C Sharp and Razor user interface technology that gets compiled together and delivered into the browser as a series of DLLs that are compiled to work on that WebAssembly runtime. When you go to a, web, a WebAssembly website, uh, not just Blazor, you'll see it downloads a bunch of binary payload that it starts using. So you might see a, a waiting um, spinner or something right before the website starts working. Typical, like you might see on some other JavaScript single page application websites. So that's how it works. We, When you build with Blazor WebAssembly, we compile together your application, put it on top of a special version of .NET, .NET 6, that's been built to run in the browser. And we ship the whole thing to the browser and it loads up and, and runs appropriately. So, Thala asks, where to learn .NET? Right here. This is a good place. Um, you can go to learn.microsoft.com. You can go to .net. Click the Learn tab up at the top, and that'll get you in and get you started as well. Holy Crow on YouTube says, I find there's a lot of great information for beginners about what things are, but I struggle applying that to get started with my own project. Ah, the blank sheet of paper problem. This is, th this is the issue um, a lot of folks see, a lot of folks run into, where 
gosh, where, what do I start with? What do I do? I would suggest taking a look at some various samples, some examples that are out there that folks are using that uh, they've published that show how they interact with their applications, how those applications start up and, and work. Find something that's similar to what you want to deliver and tinker with it. See how that works. And you'll find that jump off point. You're, you'll find where you need to go from there. All right. Um, the timer is how much time left in the AMA so that we can time box this before we get to our lesson. Um, let me see here. So 3D Polyrath on Twitch asks, side question, I'm trying to make my project progress more visible. Do I know of any way to get a webhook to webhook a Git repository to show progress in Teams? I thought there was a GitHub uh, team app, te Microsoft Teams application. Um, you should be able to do that. You should be able to get something um, installed there. So, nope, no hashtag needed. So, um, do, 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 do. is it possible to use EF Core in WebAssembly? Yes, but you're you, unless you can attach reliably, always attach to your server, you're not going to get there. So be careful of that. So, um, right, if, if you're using Entity Framework, you're trying to connect to a server, but you're not going to be able to connect outside the box, outside the, the sandbox that you're in in the browser. So you could connect to like a SQLite database, and our friend Steve Sanderson has a demo showing how to do that. Um, I just answered where to start learning.net, passing on that question. Nestor asks, is it possible with Blazor to make a stream of data from a MySQL database? Sure. You're going to need an API that's streaming that data to you. You can do that with something like Signal R. That's our technology that works with .NET to stream content, uh, to push content from a server to a browser. It works on ASP.NET Core. It works on the .NET web technologies and allows you to either push as new things arrive or to open a stream and just gradually push data to clients. And you can certainly add SignalR as a client, uh, as, a, as a client technology into a Blazor WebAssembly application. Good evening to you, Rizwan in Pakistan. Uh, Diako uh, says, I want to create my own Blazor template with CSS with I want to create my own Blazor template with a CSS framework that I want. How hard is that to do? Real easy to do. Uh, take a look at take a look at some of the .NET template blog posts from my colleague Syed Hashimi. Um, he'll get you pointed in the right direction for that. It, it's you end up taking a bunch of a bunch of your files that you want to create, adding various template stubs into the various places where you want to swap out with variables that are declared and submitted at the time that the template is invoked. Package that up as a NuGet package. It, he has instructions for all of this. And deploy that to wherever you want to install your templates from. So, um, it's, it, 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 it's, it's easier to do than it sounds. So, once you figure out and once you understand how those components all fit together as part of it, you'll, you'll start rolling on that. How you doing there? Hit tab on YouTube. No, you didn't come too late. No, you're fine. We're about a half hour in answering some AMA stuff here. Um, is that Yuri asks, what's the benefit of using SQLite in the database instead of basic local storage? Um, see, this is, this is a question that folks haven't really asked. They saw the, the demo from, from Steve Sanderson and said, oh, I need SQLite in the browser. Um, they want to be able to do SQL database queries. They want to be able to do database syncing of content from an API from a, some other server so they can run standard SQL database queries in the browser. Um, possible, doable, gr great concept for an offline application, but you're going to run into some issues around managing that SQLite database because it's completely out of your hands. Um, 
local storage does all of that. It's a standard technology. Um, you lose a little bit of the SQL interaction, but so what? Um, it's a little bit, a little bit more stable technology. <clears throat> yes, he used Entity Framework with SQLite in WebAssembly, and um, it, it's something that's possible, not something entirely recommended. So, uh, Omar says, tried Blazor two years ago. It was slow in loading. I don't know how to make loading faster. Can help make it faster. Publish your application. When, you, when you're running in development mode, when you're running a Blazor WebAssembly application in development mode, it's not. It hasn't done any publishing or tree shaking, and that hasn't optimized, right? Just like with a JavaScript application, before you publish it, you run it through Webpack. You run it through some other command line tool that ends up calling Webpack, that does all the the tree shaking. It eliminates the libraries and methods and things that you don't use. It does all the linking and uglifying, so it compresses everything down, so it gets really small before it's published in the browser. Blazor is a lot faster now with .NET six. A lot of optimizations have happened in there. A lot of things that you can do, including uh, a bit of source generation that eliminates reflection happening inside your code. Um, I can also point you to a couple websites that you wouldn't guess are WebAssembly. So, you can't figure out how to add external JavaScript files to your Blazor server app. What do you need to do? Um, add them into the www root folder of your project. <clears throat> www root folder and you need to reference those um, by either calling uh, from a JS, what is it, uh, IJS interop um, interface. You want to, it's not load module, but you want to invoke JavaScript from there, and you can use that to load modules from outside. Um, there is, there is, uh, what's it called? There's another number of samples. Look up JavaScript interop in the docs, and that'll get you in and pointed at the right direction. How you doing there, Thin Doll? What are we doing next week? Um, there we go. Now I'm getting I'm getting Twitch loaded back into Restream. Now I was disconnected for a little bit there. Hey, Johan, good to see you. Um, Angelo's here from Brazil, or is it Angelo? Thinking Portuguese pronunciation. I may have that completely wrong. Uh, Ahmed asks, I'd like to become a C-sharp master, C-sharp 10, 7 through 10 is enough, or shall I go back to C-sharp 1? Well, you're going to learn the C-sharp 1, 2, 3, all the way through 7 technologies and tools to get there to 7 through 10. So, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Um, but it, it, it's good to have a goal like that to study and learn. Trust me when I tell you. There's always somebody out there who knows more. There's always somebody out there. You can you can get pretty good at at a tool, at a technology, at a skill, but there there will always be somebody who knows more. And, and at the very highest, of course, when we talk about a programming language, are the folks that write the compiler, that that design it. They know the features like the back of their hands. So um, don't let that deter you, but set proper expectations uh how you doing there joseph uh yeah no need to go all the way back to c sharp one agreed with joseph there dan moyer is here from finley ohio good to see you hit tab is here from dallas texas good to see you um bro Warris, what's asks what's the fastest way to convert uh .net forms to blazer pages um there's there's a couple different techniques to do that uh, the folks at Amazon actually have a tool that will help you do that, um, and that's that's pretty cool. Uh, yes, there is a .NET anniversary. This is very good point. Thank you, Thindall. This is the 20th anniversary of .NET. C Sharp, Visual Basic, .NET Technologies, Visual Studio .NET came out 20 years ago, and uh, we're really excited. We're really happy for that. Uh, we're celebrating all month long. There's all kinds of cool uh, swag available to you over on the .net website that you can download wallpapers, links to build your own .net bot, kind of like kind of like this guy. He's a little bit different from the .net bot, but check it out over there. Really cool stuff. Can I have a session for middlewares and filters? Asked TG on YouTube. Um, 
We'll talk about that when we get to web applications. Probably a few month, a, a month or two out at this point, because next topic I want to get into is F Sharp. Um, I want to make sure that I get folks connected from the F Sharp team appropriately. On Twitch, Risky Code uh, says I'm trying to implement Bootstrap themes to your Blazor server side app, running into an issue where a lot of the functionality is jQuery. Uh, is there an easier way to implement those jQuery components? Uh, you're going to end up rereading it. Take a look at, I believe it's the Blazor Strap, um, is is the name of that framework that combines Bootstrap. Yeah, BlazorStrap.io will get you Bootstrap 4 and Bootstrap 5 implemented with Blazor. You'll be able to work with it and uh, do some cool things there. So BlazorStrap.io will jump you right to the, to the head of the line on that risky code. Uh, Franklin Lee on YouTube asks, is the hot reload feature supported in Blazor on .NET 6? Yes, it is. It absolutely is. Uh, can't figure out how it works? You're either going to run .NET Watch at the command line, or you're in Visual Studio 2022, and you're going to click the little fire button in there that'll do hot reload. And in all of my demos today, I'll be showing hot reload. So feel free to ask questions as we get there. Uh, Liberty, hello to you in South Africa. Welcome in. Um... Ergon Rod says, aside from the Blazing Pizza example, is there another Blazor app sample I recommend? Um, as far as simplicity, you can check out the hats, csharpfritz.com sample, and that's a simple static website that loads and presents uh, my hat collection in the browser with WebAssembly. That's one that I wrote that's cool to see. Blazing, Blazing Pizza is the one that we've been focused on just so that there isn't a bunch of these floating everywhere and hard for us to maintain. Um, our friends at Progress Software, they have a sample that they maintain as well. Ed Charbonneau over there manages a sample. That's the He was talking to me about that on Friday, and, it's, and it shows off a bunch of their components and things as well. Uh, Philippe on YouTube asks, what's the best strategy to my, update my Blazor application on the client browser? Um push a new version to your web server, and it will update automatically when you deploy. Um, Paradise Fallen uh, on YouTube asks, do I know any ASP.NET Core media storage repositories where info about files stored in database and actual content can be stored locally or in blobs? No. Um, sorry. And, and that's a bit off topic. I'm, I'm going to have to pass on that. How you doing there? C. Larby in Ghana. Uh, scrolling down here, uh, is it is it Mini on YouTube? A C Sharp book I recommend. Love the show. You're at an intermediate level from Oslo. Um, a C Sharp book that I recommend. I don't have a C Sharp book off the top of my head. Bill Wagner is the gentleman whose C Sharp books I always read and uh, really enjoyed and learned a lot from Bill. And uh, he now works at Microsoft and writes the docs for all of us to read. So. Uh, manages the teams that help write the docs. You'll see his name pop up in there as well. So I would take a look at Bill Wagner. He's got some great content out there for folks. Um, do, 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 do. Um, let me see here. Casimir, hello to you in Vienna, Austria. Why is SignalR backed in Blazor server side? Why not? SignalR is our .NET native technology for for setting up web sockets and other um, real-time interactions from server to browser. So, yeah, SignalR works great at that. It's fantastic. How you doing there, Shano, on Twitch? Um, oh, here we go. No, I think we're okay. Uh, Gobi's Basement, hello to you in South India. You've been following the series on YouTube. Helped you a lot. Catching the stream for the first time. You're very welcome. Thank you for tuning in. Um, you do not have support of WWF and .NET 6. What do you mean, WWF? WWF? Franklin Lee, hello. Uh, Jamie Wyant, Hot Reload doesn't work for you in Visual Studio 2022 unless you do Control F5. Um, click the feedback button there and let them know. That absolutely should be working. Um, let me see here. Napalm684, hello, good morning to you. It's Monday, go back to bed. <laughs> um, so, scrolling through here. 
Um, Johan, yes, there is Signal or Azure service that can be used for scaling. Yes. Windows Workflow. Yes, Windows Workflow is no longer supported in .NET 5, .NET 6. That's correct. Um, there are open source projects that are building that, that are maintaining that, but it is not supported as part of .NET 5, .NET 6. Mangesh asks, local storage or cookies, which one should I use? Um, depends. I, I prefer local storage. Um, I have a lot more flexibility with interacting with local storage versus cookies. Cookies immediately get the ire of anybody from the European Union. Um, and, and then you have to put up, then you have to put up warning messages everywhere. Oh no, this site's using cookies. Ah, cookies. No, people are terrified of cookies. Use local storage. Does the same thing. Limits the interaction with it a bit, too. Um, let me see here. Um, what was Windows Workflow? It was a way for you to, to set up what we now have in Logic Apps to be able to logically set up workflows between various components of an application. For client side, you just use a class with static variables? Sure. Absolutely. The, the European Union is saving us from cookies. Yes. And and they're about to save us from fonts, embedded content. Um, I'm not going to get into legal discussion, but they're, they're going after all kinds of embedded content now. Um, and, and sending your browser to request content from servers that you didn't specifically request. So... Um, yeah, cookie, cookies and local storage is a depends answer. I do prefer, I do prefer local storage. So back to Usenet forms for them. Well, not going to go quite that far. Um, uh, Shara Fudin asks, why do we manually call state has changed? Why not the Blazor build in support for this? This is a good question from Shara Fudin. So there is a, a method call. That, that you can execute inside your Blazor components. State has changed. And you call that to notify the Blazor runtime, hey, you need to repaint. You need to re-render this section of the, of the content here. And that happens because something triggered, something happened outside of a normal event. A button was clicked. A, a component was rendered on screen. Something else happened. And you need to notify... Something changed on this other section of the screen that we need to repaint. We need to reevaluate and and update over there. So that's why you need to call state has changed. Um, not it's not a terrible thing to have to call it, um, but Blazor Blazor does do it automatically for you when you have events, and um, I'll show you that today. So. Uh, cookie warnings aren't about cookies. It's about processing personal information. Uh, I'm not going to get further into the discussion about it, but yes. Um, so. Um, yep. Yep. Google and other, other companies are going to be by EU, by EU law. It, 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 we're about to see a, a few step backs few steps back because of the EU uh, law and privacy constraints and what's being perceived as breaches of privacy. Um, so. <laughs> Google makes iPhones according to to other governments. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've seen that as well. And some, some folks in American government have said that as well. So. How you doing there, Miguel on YouTube? Any tips on handling async tasks between components? Sometimes uninitialized async runs twice and could result in trouble. Greetings from Colombia. Miguel, you're right. It sometimes does run twice. And here's the thing. It probably, it, it might need to. There's reasons why uninitialized might need to run twice. If components are moved, hidden, and, and redisplayed, yeah, on initialized is going to run again. Same thing with on parameters set. It it could run multiple times um, as parameters are set on the component. 
let's walk through and, and, and look at that a little bit today in our demos. Um, because it certainly can happen. And if it's a new instance of the component that which typically is what's happening, um, you want to make sure you handle that appropriately so you don't keep hitting your API, keep querying the API multiple times. So, yeah, the, the American... Okay, yeah, the American politicians, yes, we're making that mistake. You're right. Moving on here. Uh, no, don't do a men monitor. You can't do a monitor on WebAssembly. You're going to run into some real issues there. Um... But you, you like seeing that? Restrictions on big tech. Referencing fonts and embedding content from another from other websites is kind of it's kind of what the internet's based on. Sharing information. Any MVU or MVVM framework I'd like to recommend. Prism is really good. Um the um, um there's a new one coming as part of .NET Maui. Our friend James Clancy works on it. Comet is coming um th that's going to be pretty interesting as well um all right um you can do a lock in blazor web assembly but once again i'd avoid it as much as possible you're going to run into issues there it, it's it can get it can get issue that's right Crypt, uh, there are crypto scams running rampant and folks are worried about embedding fonts and images from other websites. Um, the time is up. Our time is up here. Um, for the AMA, that was... Uh, always enjoy the AMA. Always enjoy answering questions and going through and talking about things. Um, we're going to move on and talk about... and talk about uh, interacting with Blazor components. How we can take our, our components have parameters not just talk to each other cascading parameters um so that you you set a value in one component and it is available in child components as well uh we're also going to see about managing events and interacting with events in components and finally we're going to talk about state management um and passing state around inside of our application and uh we might get into local storage might get into local storage. We'll see how it goes. Um, hang on. All right. Let's... All right. I think we're ready to go. Um, Two-way data binding. Yeah, we, we can absolutely do, do that. Custom data binding is going to be a little bit further along. But we can definitely do two-way data binding. We'll talk about that today. How to bind multiple values. Bind multiple values. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by multiple values. Um, touch on local storage listening for... Well, <clears throat> you don't want to listen for changes on local storage because you're the one controlling it. Who else is changing it? Security risks while using Blazor WebAssembly? Not currently. You're shipping all the code down to the browser. It needs to run locally in the browser, so you're shipping it down. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely talk about state. All right, let me get things wrapped up here. Let me grab the coffee, grab the phone, and we'll head over to... Uh, yeah, head over to the other side of the studio here so we can talk about this all right um yes there is javascript interop but i've got a component that'll do that even easier for you so let's uh change over my phone change the mic there we go grab the coffee got to make sure we have coffee coffee is important Right, and uh, let's get over and, and get to the uh, get to the big set. Here we go. Ah, oh, nuts! Microphone cable got tangled. Um, I've had folks ask me, "Hey, why don't you use wireless? Why don't you use a wireless headset?" Quite frankly, the quality's not the best. Um, 
I've got everything completely wired in and I can um, absolutely get exactly uh, the sound that I'm looking for from this microphone. Um, how you doing there, Cesar? Yes, cafe time indeed. Uh, let me make sure over here. No, no, there it is. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, let me see. Test your coder in client-side applications. There's no hidden or secured resource. That's right. Everybody can see what you put in a browser. Um, bu -bu 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 -bu. Let me see. Have I considered a good shotgun mic? Uh, yes, and not going to do it, only because I, I live in a, a home with other folks, and I don't want it to pick up the rest of that stuff. Um, what is that? What is that phone? Uh, yeah, this is in an iPhone, iPhone 12, iPhone. Yeah, I didn't get the 13 yet. This is the iPhone 12 Pro Max, whatever. Um, uh, you'd really like to see some tutorials on domain-driven design, CQRS, and event sourcing being used together. Um, check out the architecture workshop over on my YouTube channel. Those type of advanced topics, we can get into a little bit further down, but that's going to be out a bit. I've already got a, a number of other uh, a number of other topics that, that we have planned. Those types of architecture discussions, a um, little bit further down the road, late spring, summer, um, that I would be able to get to that. Yes, everyone can see what you put in the browser, even your mother. All right. Um, let me see. How we doing here? Did I miss anything? Nope. Good. Let's talk about this topic today. Interacting with components. There's a lot going on here with components. We, we've learned how to build components. We've learned how to pass parameters into them. We've, we've learned how to interact with them. We've learned how to put together some CSS and, and wire it up to our components so that we can work with them. Um, and, and style our components appropriately and just our components. Really, really cool stuff. So, what's next? Well, I want to do more interactions with components, including here, parameters, event callbacks. So it's one thing to have, have a box, a, a component on screen that has something that I've styled appropriately or I've passed content into it, but what happens when I actually interact with that thing? If there's a button on it or a drop down box and I want to have it trigger some other thing when that event happens, how do I do that? I want to raise an event. I want to listen for that event and take some steps based on that. So we're going to talk about event callbacks, which are slightly different from what we've seen in regular .NET events. We're going to talk about parameters and this part here. Somebody mentioned this last time, attribute splatting. Sounds violent. It's not. It's actually a pretty good, pretty good technique that we're going to look at here today. Cascading parameters. So we're going to combine parameters together. And I'm sorry, we're going to combine components together. So we have some components hosted inside of other components, and we'll pass variables from outside all the way through. Real easy to see. Session state. We'll talk about global state as well here as we go through. All right. Um, let me see here. Uh, do a session on making PWAs. Um, just exactly. There's a, a comment here. There's a checkbox when you start a new project in Visual Studio to enable PWA. There's also a command line switch on the template to enable it as well. We'll get to .NET MAUI after it's released. There, we will absolutely have a series on .NET MAUI. Um, yeah, Wordle in the browser, you can see the words. Yes. My YouTube is youtube.com slash C Sharp Fritz. And uh, I have a bunch of videos, tutorials over there. They're archives of my live streams that take place over on Twitch. Twitch.tv slash C Sharp Fritz. All right. Let's, let's get in and talk here. There's a link to my event reference if I need it. So, we last time we were building some card components, and let me 
start with this sample code and run the application. So I'm going to use uh, hot reload here so that it's constantly reloading and refreshing as we change the, uh, the sample here. So this is in my demo and I'm going to execute this with .NET. Watch. All right. So as things change, it'll update my browser and we'll see exactly the code um, painted in there as it, as it changes. So here it is starting up. Uh, I don't want to do a session restore. Thanks so much. And I'm running here. This is, uh, yeah, I, I know something went wrong. I don't want you running right now. I believe if I'm, yeah, this is Blazor WebAssembly. Hot Reload is wired up. <clears throat> and I have these samples that we're going to talk through today. Now, we built a card component last time. And it had this very simple syntax. <clears throat> I've got, and, it, and right, it's, it's just outputting a bootstrap card element here, right? So I've got some header text that I'm passing in, blazer hat. I'm outputting it right there. And whatever's inside that component, I'm just outputting right here. Literally just echo that content into the body of the component. But, right, so there's the page, there's my, the card. And if we take a look at that component and its source code, it's it's a div of class card. I have a card header here, and I have a card body. We're gonna see what this cascading value does for us. And all that it's doing is taking that header text, which is a parameter being passed in, and we learn about the child content, this standard render fragment parameter for this component. So it will capture whatever's inside the card tags and insert that into this parameter that I can then use here to output that information. Just dump everything that's inside those tags right there. Okay? So, we learned that last time. Pretty simple concept around how the component works. And as we start to compose these things together, it's becoming more interesting. There's more capabilities that we can take a look at. Uh, there's a question here from Ranjit. Can we take a look at the source code on GitHub? Absolutely. Let me get you that link. If you're watching on, if you're watching on YouTube, there's a link just below that'll take you to C Sharp Fritz, C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. Oh, wonderful. What happened there? What happened there? Um, one second here. I think it's... There we go. I lost chat over here. Um, so, inside here, I'm, if you asked a question in the last minute or so, you're going to need to ask it again because my, uh, my chat screen just refreshed. Uh, we're in 0303 here. So, github.com slash C sharp fritz slash C sharp underscore with underscore C sharp fritz. And we are in sessions, season 03, and this is 0303 today. Okay? All right. Let's do this. So, um, yeah. We're good. And it, it feels like my camera's going out of focus. Um, let's get into the content. So, we saw and we learned about parameters. Let me go back over to here. Um, but what if we want to pass events into things? We want to handle this. We want to handle that click event 
Uh, no, I'm I'm still not getting any content coming through on. On my um, restream just disconnected from my uh, my teleprompter, so I've lost chat. I'm gonna maximize it over here so I can see it. Um, what's my opinion of on cascading state? Um, versus using something like Fluxor. Um, I think Cascading State is a better, more... There we go. Now it comes... Now it's coming through. Is a... It is a more native, um, uh, easier way to pass around data that you want specific to just that section of a web application. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Versus having that shared state that you're passing around, um... That has its place also. That's more like a global state for the user that's interacting. We'll see. Nah, Jason, we're only on YouTube and Twitch today. So, all right. So if I've got a button like here and I want to click it, and it's just a simple increment. I click that button and it increments this counter. I can write my own little callback down here that... I can I can click and this is incrementing that as well. Um, so what's happening here? Let's talk about this. Let's talk about what is making those things work. So inside my second demo over here, right? I have a card button component that I've declared right here and it has an on click event handler now we're used to seeing on click on buttons that's that of course a button has a click event that's what happens when you press the button so how do I handle that where does that come from how, and and what does it mean now in the case of this this is a blazer component called card button right I mean clearly there isn't a there isn't a card button component in HTML. So when I have this component, I can declare my own events here. I can also declare a regular HTML button and I can wire up an on click event here as well using the at on click syntax. This syntax says this is a C sharp event that Blazor needs to wake up and handle. So you can use that to interact with your, your HTML on page. And we'll see that in a second. So this card button has an on-click event called button clicked. To create your own event handlers, let me go through to card button here. I think I can F12 to it. Yes. So and it generates a little bit of HTML. Here is a button. Right there. Here is a button. Okay. And it outputs an HTML button. And this HTML button, just like I showed you, has an at on click event handler. So when you click on the HTML button, Blazor is going to pick up the click event and is going to call this method. And let me put a character return there. Is going to execute this method, and it, it's got this text inside the button. We're used to seeing that. That's standard HTML. Um, so do more with click is right here. Now, notice I'm not passing any event arguments into it. I'm not actually calling it, right? I'm I'm not invoking this method from the on click here. It's not passing in with parentheses, you know, here's the thing that comes along with it. I'm passing instead, when you wire up an at on click event handler here, I'm passing a delegate. I'm passing a pointer to that method. I'm, I'm literally just giving it the name of the method to execute. Now, it will, Blazor will locate that method, execute it, 
and it will optionally execute it asynchronously and await the response if it is an async decorated method. Or you can drop it and just have it return void. It's not going to return anything. Additionally, it will optionally pass in this right here, the mouse event arguments. That's a special class that Blazor makes available that tells more information about the the mouse button. I'm sorry, where the mouse was, what mouse button was clicked, and how you interacted with that that click interaction. So I can look at the args here, and we can see all kinds of properties that might be interesting to you as a developer when somebody clicks a button or clicks on some part of, of your screen, clicks on a link, clicks on a drop down box, clicks on a logo, clicks on whatever, a play button, I don't know. You may want to know that it was the right mouse button that clicked, that the alt key was being held down, control was being held down as they clicked those things, right? The, the actual location Right There's the offset and the location on screen. Offset relative to the button, the location on screen of where exactly the mouse was when that click happened. You know all this information. It's passed to you by these mouse event arcs. Now, you don't always need to receive it. You can certainly handle this and, and do nothing, not receive those arguments at all. This, this works just fine if I eliminate this. In fact, let's just do this. Okay. Um, oh, I forgot the, forgot the curly brace. There we go. Um, good. So back over here and I can, I can click that button and you see it increments the counter. Okay. So when I have those arguments, I can do other things with them, right? And it still works. So you may want to interact with them. You may want to put an if condition that says, well, only if the control key was held down when this was clicked or only when the right mouse button clicked, okay? So you have those options. Now, before I get to this and this, let me take a look at chat and get caught up here. Um, scrolling up here. Um, Ranjit her says, I heard cascading value state slows down performance. Is it really recommended? We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. There's ways to control that. Um, yep, it's in managing the updates is what's going on and the size of the hierarchy that you're going through. Um, do, 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 do. How does mouse events work if somebody uses a tablet, which is a touch screen, and not using the mouse? Um, it, it will transfer other information instead. So you still get mouse event orgs, even though it's a touch event. So, um, all right. So there are other things like swipe gestures that you can interact with as well. Um, I haven't personally done those, but there are gestures and events out there you can interact with. Um, okay, moving on. So this just handles this, just handles when this button is clicked, right? But this itself is, is me writing my own button, right? Let me put that over there. So this is, this is my button, this is Jeff Fritz's button, and I want to have that information be made available to the, the page or the other component that's hosting this. So what you can do is expose a parameter that will raise that one-click event message. So. I declare a parameter, it's a public parameter called on click. And when the button itself, the inside button is clicked, I raise and say, invoke, notify this, the, the on click event happened. 
Now, the type of this is an event callback. Event callback, in this case, is a generic model here because I'm going to pass back a payload. I'm passing back a collection of arguments that specifies, hey, there's some other information that happened in this on click that you need to receive. So the event callback is a delegate that you can receive and inside your component then invoke and you invoke it asynchronously because you're going to pass along that information to any other component that's listening for that event to happen and in this case we're passing along some mouse event arguments now you can pass through any type of arguments that you need for your component maybe you maybe you built a, a video player component and and you have a slider on it <clears throat> that has here's the position of of where we are in the time on the component and when somebody slides that slider and you let go well you want to raise information you want to pass along information about where that time slider that that playhead stopped where where it was released and you want to say oh on playhead changed and here's information about the new time that might be important to trigger advertising or or right trigger actually moving the location in the video that you're playing all kinds of stuff so you can specify whatever class you want here as the arguments that you want to share when this event is triggered you don't have to pass any arguments you can just pass back this event happened and and just the presence of that event is something to trigger in another um in another page or something right i if i remove this right and just make it a straight event callback i remove these args here and now over on my page where i'm listening for button clicked say card button button clicked well button clicked is expecting to receive mouse event arcs. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. And it still works. So putting those in the mix here, let me put all that content back, right? That and that. Now, and if I hold down the shift key because I have that little bit happening in there, I thought we were doing something with shift key here. Hang on. Shift button pressed. Oh, it's just getting written to the console. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, F12. You're not going to give me F12. Are you kidding? Um, there it is. Let's dock that. No, I didn't want to do that. Dock it at the bottom. Bring up the console. Delete that. So just clicking it, and it's saying shift button pressed false. If I hold down the, the button, the shift key, shift button pressed true. Because I'm interpreting that, inspecting those arguments, and I can tell what happened. Okay. Let me take a look back here at chat. Get caught up. Oh, do, do, do. how can I handle child component click event? That's exactly what we're doing here, Sharif Houdin. Yep. Yep, how can you handle it from the parent component? So that's what's happening. Inside my child component here, I set up that parameter that passes the information along to anybody that's listening that hosts this component. So I notify that the, the parent component or the parent page by invoking that on click event. So, how you doing there? Is that uh, Sultanbek in Uzbekistan? Welcome. Appreciate you joining us. All right. So, that's a little bit about events. There's a lot of events out there on the various objects that you can interact with, that you can do things with to improve the interactions between components so that you can have that user event happen and it goes and does something else or right maybe something happened 
we mentioned signal r earlier maybe you were past an event an event happened on the server and you want to raise an event because this component is listening for it oh we got a new chat message raise an event new chat message and it's going to be put and handled appropriately elsewhere why async await in the do more with click event asks uh, paulo so um the async and the await here is because we don't know what else is going on above us we don't know what else is going on inside the um the component the page that's hosting this the event callback does not have a straight invoke method it's only invoke async so we need this event handler to be async as well and part of that is because there's javascript interaction happening here where the the javascript engine right is is handling that click and passing that information into WebAssembly, and we're going and doing things so we're ha actually interacting asynchronously from the engine that triggered us okay and it's i'm, I'm dramatically simplifying here but when you're crossing the two runtimes when you when you have dotnet code that executes javascript code or javascript code that executes dotnet code or dotnet code that reaches out and makes a request from a server whether it's a database server or a web server you don't know what's happening after you send that request so we await it it's an asynchronous request so that we can we can wait appropriately for that other system for that other runtime to finish processing so we are in an asynchronous chain here because that button click happened on the page it's raised information to us that we need to asynchronously go through and process and quite frankly you don't necessarily want to await it all the time because you want that button release to appear properly what if i do await task delay 5000 so wait five seconds i'm in the middle of handling the click event so if i go down here and i click that it's not doing what i thought it would it's not doing what i thought it would um reload that i want to I'm, I'm trying to make this break not break is the wrong word um, it's releasing immediately here. Um, let's put it up there. Bring this up. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not doing that a wait for me and waiting five seconds. Um, that's interesting. Oh, wait a sec. No, no, it's that one. Yeah, it's not waiting at all. Like, I expect it to await that and then do the button was clicked and... It's going right through. I wasn't expecting that. Huh. Um, I'll restart the app. rebuilding so yeah there we go now it's now it's doing it and taking entirely too long <laughs> so now down here click that and it waits. It's gonna wait those five seconds and we should see content start to appear. Or not. Hot reload doesn't pick up all the changes. Sometimes fun things happen here. And after five seconds, there it goes. So, 
you may want that to be more responsive. So you're going to want to be able to await and hand things off appropriately depending on your scenario. So something to be aware of. Let me hot. Let me force the reload there. Yeah. What I've found with hot reload more and more is, um, when after you let it run for a bit, it um, it's patched content changes so much that you re need to restart the app. Um, so why do you need a public setter? I could have made it. Um, I could have certainly made, um, uh, here, I could have made that internal because it's being exposed to this page up here. Uh, yes. Right. Um, why are you saying it should be public? It shouldn't, it doesn't need to be public. I should have been able to make that internal. Um... It should have taken that. All right, I stand corrected by the framework. It needs to be public because you're exposing that outside the component to another page. I would have thought internal would have worked there, but because this is a because this is a parameter, it needs to be public. That's why. That's why. Yeah, thank you, Michael Bond. Yep. Um, let me see here. Um, how does Blazor throw error to client-side users? Are these common JavaScript errors, or are they translated to JavaScript? So if we throw an error, sure, let's throw an exception. So I'll throw a new exception. This is an error. Uh, get rid of that. Right, so now when I click, there's an error handler that wraps the page, and it puts this up. What it also does is it drops a message here in the console that you can interact with. Now there's a new feature that was introduced with .NET 6 called Error Boundaries. Uh, Blazor Error Boundary. Mm -hmm. And what you're able to do is wrap a section of code where you want to be able to handle errors. And you can then have not just here's the content that I want it to invoke and have some special user interface appear appropriate for just that section of the page. This was just introduced with the version that was released in November, .NET 6, but you can use this to help hide some of those error handling things, but you can certainly interact with exceptions in .NET, uh, in the .NET code of your Blazor application, the same way that they're interacted with in any other .NET application. That little error message that appeared, let me just make sure you see where that comes from. Inside the index page, if I scroll down here, there it is, there's this little bit right here div ID blazer error UI and it will automatically show this if there's a, the the framework will show this if there's an error so you can change the contents of this div to be whatever you'd like right um, Fritz made a stupid error reload and hopefully he fixed this John and you can change the background color, whatever you'd like, and you can make your your global error handler here look like however you need. Um, and that's how you can tell I'm from Philly. <laughs> All right, um, moving on. There you go. Um, close that. Let's get rid of that exception there, and we shall move on. Um, more questions there in chat. Um, oh my gosh, Carl Edwards, thank you so much for the kind words. 
Um, Jason, Jason, uh, on YouTube asks, is it possible to render sections in Blazor? If not, how can it dynamically add different sections to my layout? Um, so your layout, if we head back, so we, we talked a little bit about layouts last time. Um, typically you have one section that your page is interacting with and that's the body here. Blazor, I am, yeah, you can't call render section from Blazor. It doesn't, it doesn't know how to do that. So if you want to add other components that measure and manage other parts of your layout, you can do that like we do right here with this nav menu. So the navigation menu is there and its hierarchy of components and things are all managed inside of that. If you need to manage two hierarchies of components that are working together on the page, I would create a page then that has those two components and render those components and hand off and manage those two separately uh, and have them each manage their own hierarchy on the page. I hope that makes sense. Um, yes, just talked about error boundary, showed that. Um, the event wrapper trick. You're welcome, Data Goose. Um, and now it's recorded, so other folks can go back and take a look at it. Can you create a component programmatically, asks Hector. Yes, it, and it's it, it's kind of tricky to create a component programmatically. I'll show you quickly um, what some source code might look like for that. So, uh, hand coded component uh, dot cs, and I'll give this a namespace. What is this? Uh, demo dot components. Sure. Um, public class uh, hand coded component. Move that stuff out of the way. Uh, and this is going to inherit from component base. Component base is the base class that all components inherit from, but this is now a component. Doesn't actually do anything yet until you override a method in here, build render tree. And here's my other event handlers, on after render, on initialized, so I can interact with those, but I need to build the render tree here. And this is where you're going to look at this and go, oh, I didn't want to get in that deep. Um, you start adding elements to this. So um, I'm going to add some content. And I need to provide a sequence. Uh, and then that text content. Hello from um, hand-coded component. Okay. Okay. Now I can use this component. I can I can add stuff around if I wanted to, right? Um, builder add. Is it? Uh, I can add markup. Um, I'm I'm thinking here. I want to add not an element reference. Um, if I do it this way, not the text, not the render fragment markup string. I forget how to add elements. I don't do it this way anymore, but I can reference and use that now over here in my razor page. Um, I'm going to put it right after the counter here. Hand coded component. There it is. I'll just save that right there. I'm missing a semicolon. I'm sorry, a curly brace. It is where? That doesn't make sense to me, but all right, fine. And um, Hot Reload did not pick that up, probably because I added a new file. Reloading. 
hello from hand coded component so you can write components by hand and in with code and generate and stick it in here like that not for the faint of heart doable but takes a little bit of work um it's it's not something that i recommend for 90 95 percent of the folks out there write your components in razor files it's gonna be a heck of a lot easier to work with um folks that need to write really complex components component vendors folk, folks that are building component frameworks they'll look at and build using this technique so you can do it probably not the best idea for everybody let me catch up with with the rest of chat um how to add pages in dynamically from client side you're not going to be adding pages dynamically that's no Ew. um do you add html dynamically to a to a server server based application no you'll upload markup and render it as a page that hosts and includes that markup um Bulat wonders if steve sanderson would do live sessions um Steve's a fantastic engineer, and he likes to have his demos very well planned out, um, test them extensively to make sure they work, because Steve will do some very interesting things in his demos, and he want, wants to make sure he delivers a high-quality demo. Um, not sure he would be interested in doing live sessions going through something that isn't quite planned out, and that is a little bit more on the fly like this. Um, he has participated in some of our stand-up sessions, but um, folks like me that can that they can handle and do the live interactions like this and teaching um, provide a little bit of that buffer so that uh, Steve can focus on building a great product as well. Uh, Sean asks, "Is JSON in a lot of use still?" Yes, absolutely. So is, um, of course, so are protocol buffers as part of gRPC. That's become especially interesting. Um, what is the best way to handle state in Blazor? We're going to talk about that in just a minute and depends on uh, best is up in the air. There's all kinds of ways. Uh, you created hand coded components for dynamic SVG. Well, there's a, there's a great example of someplace where you do want to hand create hand code components, generating SVG on the fly. Yes, absolutely want to be able to hand code that because you're the conditional insert measurement and creation of various elements yeah yeah that's a perfect example of something that's a bit more advanced than just i'm wrapping a couple text boxes or i'm wrapping a couple divs that i want to be able to repeat in different places in my application great example andy thank you for sharing that um marvin says uh, a page is a component as well how can i trigger a 404 when entering a page with a parameter that needs to be checked first um how do you trigger a 404 so that's a great question and i'm i'm blanking on it right now you're going to want to handle that in your routing and when you're on a page and you want to require a parameter like this um it'll trigger a 404 if that's not set so um public int id and uh what is it to get from query string supply parameter from query and I believe it's like that. Um, I haven't used this because I've been using the other way. Yeah. I believe I can just do that. Uh, okay. So now I get a 404 because it's required on the route for this. 
So if that value isn't present, you get a 404. So by eliminating that, there it is. All right. Moving on. Uh, let me get rid of that. Actually, supply parameter from query would have been if it's a query string, question mark, whatever. That was if it was a path, but how do you check if ID one exists then? You, you're going to do that in your uninitialized. And if it doesn't exist, you need to handle a message on your page. You've actually arrived there. You won't be able to return a, a, a does not exist inside of WebAssembly. On Blazor server side, not sure. I need to dig into it. Um, a bunch of questions coming in here. Let me get through these through these real quick, and I'm going to get to the next part of the uh, lesson here. Um, do, 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 do. Sharif Houdin asks, how fast events can work in a large enterprise system? Uh, subscribing to events across multiple pages. Um, what do you mean by how fast? It, it responds immediately. It, it responds as soon as it's heard. I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that. How fast, how, how fast does a button click trigger things? I, I don't know how to answer that. I'm sorry. HitTab asks, uh, do we have to follow the naming convention uh, to stack our components in its folder? For example, we'll get too crowded when our app becomes bigger with lots of components. You can name that folder however you want. Um, absolutely. Uh, uh, I keep the folder named components over here because it's easy for folks, especially folks when I'm teaching, to locate here's the components. You may have various uh, sections of your application, the accounting, the, in, the, uh, the warehouse management, um, the administrative areas. You want to put those pages with their components under those folders and structure it that way. Go for it. Nothing's preventing you from doing that. This is just an easy way for us to show and introduce these concepts so they're in separate folders for folks to be able to find. Um, what's the purpose of routing when everything can be in the index page and use logic to decide what to display? You're right. Everything could be on one page. But how many lines of code do you really want to manage on that one page? Is it easier to separate and have multiple pages and use routing then so each one of your pages is 100 lines of code versus one index page that's 10,000 lines of code. It's a maintenance decision and discussion you get into at that point. You want to group and place things appropriately so that it's easy to maintain. Also, if you only have one file for your whole application that's 10,000 lines of code, how do you share and manage that in source control and merging changes with multiple folks on your team interacting, on your project team interacting with that one file. Because uh, Andy might be working on lines 50 through 75, and Fritz might be working on lines 100 through 150, and Anne, she might be working on lines 5,000 through 5,050. We're working on different sections, but when it comes time to merge everything back together, <clears throat> it's gonna be a mess. So how do we do that? So separate things out into separate pages, and now those are each different pages. They're different files that are only a couple hundred lines of code each. And it's easy then to maintain those updates appropriately in those different areas of your application. Um, what happens if the record doesn't exist? Call the API. If it doesn't exist, use Navigation Manager to go to a 404. You can do that. You can certainly do that. Um, but you're moving the browser at that point. Do you really want to move the browser? You probably want to do something more like uh, just re return an error message, not found, and give them some options of what to do with it. Is view model and MVVM a uh, way to manage state in Blazor? Yeah, sure. Um, why did Steve do custom sync and state handling is in his car checker PWA instead of using built-in out-of-the-box Blazor PWA capabilities to show you that it was possible? That's why. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. At what point would you start using code behind or leave code in the at code block? Asks Brave Cobra. Um, this is a, a question I get a lot. 
I I look at my code in the number of page downs. I measure it in the number of page downs. And when I have to start paging down once, uh, oops, that's F12 I hit, not page down. Once, oh, come on. Right? Once, twice, three times. That's borderline move that content to a code behind. <clears throat> move that move that code out somewhere else because it's getting there's too many concepts in one file to manage. I look at this, my personal preference, yours might be different, is I want to separate that when I start seeing too many concepts in one file to manage. Um, yes, you can create your own 404 layout component, pass it to a not found component. Yeah, that absolutely works. Um, when you have over thousands of lines of code, yeah, and your tools start getting a little buggy. Um, would I recommend Clean Code by Robert Martin to all new developers? Yes, absolutely. There's all kinds of good things to be found in there. Um, uh, what do I think about designers and developers in one component, which is HTML and C-sharp logic in the same component? Asks Shara Fudin. Yeah, absolutely. Folks have that in, in React right now with JSX pages. So, yes, it's very well acceptable. How would you open a page in a new tab or even a new window? Um, uh, a, with an A link targeting underscore blank. Um, Andy would always prefer code behind because the razor editor is not as good at, with the code behind stuff. Currently, you're right with that. It, it is, it, it does have some shortcomings. All right, we've got about 20 minutes left and I'm only through the second demo here about events. Let's go talk about, what's the next one here? Uh, oh, other attributes. Other parameters that you may want to pass in here. Um, so, there's other parameters you may want to pass in, like maybe a style component here. And you want to be able to receive that and do something with it. And this is done with something called attribute splatting. We can capture these unmatched parameters and, and splat them. So we capture them as an entire blob and we want to take them to somewhere else in our HTML and we want to, we want to stretch them out and splat, just stick it here inside that output HTML. And I can do that with this style component and I see my demo down here isn't actually doing that. Let's, uh, let's go finish writing that in here. So, um, yeah, this will work. So the card style is the component we're looking at here. And I want to be able to pass into this. Yes, it does, good. I want to be able to pass into here, style equals text decoration. And I know that's behind me now. There we go. Text decoration underline. <clears throat> I'll save that. And you see it applied the underline style to everything here. How do we do that? How do we pass along that style information that I didn't explicitly declare, but I want to pass it into my component? So what we can do in the card style over here is I've declared another parameter. And this is another convention thing. This is another parameter called values. You can call this whatever, you can give it whatever name you'd like, but it receives a dictionary of type string and object. Why string and object? Because when you look at here, these extra attributes we're capturing are a string, that tag name style. And this is going to be, it's gonna be a string in this case, but you might pass in a .NET object. So I wanna be able to receive this as an object to do something with it. The trick here is I decorate this as a parameter and specify this optional uh, input attribute, capture unmatched values equals true. When you specify that, <coughs> any parameter on this component that isn't explicitly captured with the parameter attribute, like, so here's header text, any parameter is going to be stuffed into this values property that's a dictionary of type string and object. I can then reach into there, pull out th those values, and put them on my component. So I can I can do something like this if I wanted. 
right? So let's do this. Where I'm going to say style equals, well, if we did get some values and the values contains a style, then output the style value on the div. Otherwise, eh, don't not put anything. Don't do anything with this and put anything inside there. So by doing that, I get this still outputting with my style there. So that also means if I put something up here like class equals foo, right? Um, that doesn't flow through to here. Right, if I do an inspect of this, right? Foo didn't flow through. It just grabbed the style attribute and put it on my div. But what if I just want to take everything else left over and just output it there? That's where this comes in. And this is attribute splatting. This is saying at attributes. Just take whatever is in this attributes dictionary, this values dictionary, and merge those into this element. So, saving that, and uh, that's the header. There it is. So there it is. Style text decoration, and notice it changed the class to foo. It changed that because it merged and replaced the class that I had listed here because I specified a class there. Delete that. Come back over here. And uh, I lost my class. Class equals card. It should have brought that in still. What? Anyway. Should have picked up and brought and left card there. There it is. So that was an artifact from the hot reload. So that still exists and lives there because I didn't specify an override class on my component, right, on my page. So that gives me a way to override it, right? Uh, and if I put foo back in there, it changed to foo, okay? Yeah, it's not replacing it. That's interesting. So there you go. Um, let me see here. Let me catch up. Any tips for new people gen joining the industry as developers? Sorry, we're late in the in the stream. Um, check out learn.microsoft.com. Always be learning. There's lots of material out there, and tech is always changing. Um, I'm, I can't dwell on that at this point in the lesson. Oh, sorry. Hey, catch me in the in the AMA section in the first 40 minutes of of a stream, and we'll definitely talk further. Marvin says, wouldn't it make more sense to echo those out within a loop? Uh, you can certainly do that. You're very welcome to do that. This makes it really easy to just say, smear everything in here. Just put it on there. Would I recommend a dynamic component rather than a render fragment if I have an iframe incentive? Not even going into too much of a question. They're too specific. I've got 10 minutes left, sorry. Do I uh, prefer a nav bar on my left side? Sure, why not? Is there a way to suggest topics for the series? Open an issue over in the C sharp for C sharp Frit with C sharp Fritz. Um, drop an issue in here. Uh, Blazor to Azure SQL database. Somebody's asked for help with. Uh, so drop a message in here. I'll go through and answer these. Some of these, yeah, I need to clean up and get to. But happy to take those there. Um. You can, you can join my Discord. Uh, if you go over to um, the C-Sharp Fritz channel on Twitch, there's a link there to get into my Discord, and I'm happy to answer questions further over there. All right. So that was other parameters. 
let's talk about cascading parameters. So if we want to pass information down into our other components, um, how do I do that? How do I pass information down a hierarchy of components? So maybe I've got um, the color I want to pass into. So we do that with this cascading value element here. So this basically says define a, a variable called body font color, assign it this value, right? So you have name value and any component inside of this hierarchy that listens for that cascading value will receive this and can interact with it. Let me show you. Let's close some of these pages. I went through and answered a bit too many questions. Uh, let me see. Here we go. So, in this case, and this has changed a little bit here. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, that's fine. So, this is passing in two values. Um, a body background color and a body font color with these two values. Light blue and purple. Inside my hierarchy here, I have the card. And the card is passing through a body background color of light green. But inside card body here, this is where I'm finally receiving those values. So I had cascading value element inside my markup. I have cascading parameter. I decorate the property that I want to actually capture that value. So here, the font color, I'm receiving that body font color and it's gonna put that as a string in here. Body BG color, it's receiving that. Now that was all the way up on the page that was declared. It's gonna receive that and put it in this string. So consequently, I have my style up here and it outputs Right. It outputs all of that content. Style color equals this, background color equals this. Why are you why are you Yes it does. Uh it's because I wrapped. Um... There we go. So it's going to grab these values and stash them in there. So if I go back to, um, yeah, this page, right? It's passing through the body background color is light blue. The body font color is purple, but it's being overridden inside of the card with that value. So if I get rid of that, Come on. What don't you like here? Um, save that. Re force the reload. There it goes. So now it's light blue with purple text. Right. Back over here. If I make the body background color, let's make that purple with white text and it updates automatically and it's being passed all the way down the hierarchy. Now, why would you do this hierarchy instead of some global state or passing parameters directly? Because I'm disconnected from it. I'm passing it from a page all the way down into some child component way down the hierarchy. Now, I only made it two components deep, but when you're passing these along, it's important to know it could be picked up anywhere in the hierarchy and listened to makes it very handy and useful to be able to manage and pass values from outside all the way in to those components that need it. Other thing I want to show about that is when you specify those cascading values, I believe there's a read only or is it on the on the parameter? 
I, I want to say there's a way to specify that this is read only. And I'm, I'm blanking on it right now. No, that's not it. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to pass on it. There's a way to specify it's read only and that'll release some resources as well. Um, um, <laughs> you'd be really careful using cascading parameters within pages. They have a nasty bug when using a navigation manager. Haven't seen it. Um, I'd like to know more. Drop me a line about that. Um, is it safe to have your website connect and query direct to Microsoft SQL Server? Sorry, uh, off topic. Can't get to it. I'm not going to talk about answer a security question. I've got five minutes left. Uh, is it possible to see previous streams on YouTube? Yes. Uh, YouTube.com slash dot net. Look for the playlist C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. Is it possible to have more than one cascading parameter? Yep. I've... That's exactly what I'm showing in this demo. Um, this is receiving two cascading parameters. And inside here, I'm passing two cascading values from my sample page. Is fixed equals true? Is that what it is? Yeah, there it is. And that, that declares, thank you, is fixed equals true on the cascading value declares that it's read-only and it can't be changed. Thank you so much, friends. Um, appreciate you jumping in and helping me there as I was not remembering the feature. Um, you can update a value in a parent component, yes, and that's why that what the is fixed does. You can update a value from the child and the parent will see that change. Um, does C-sharp help you with C++? Yes and no, depends. Can't, sorry, way off topic. I got four minutes left. Uh, what's the topic next time? I got to figure that out. Sorry, I don't know it off the top of my head just yet. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Thank you, Cameron. Appreciate the kind words. On parameters, async gets triggered. Yes, it does. When you navigate from a page to another using a cascading parameter. Yes, exactly. That's not a bug. That's, yes, absolutely. That's what happens. Can you update multiple values in the parent from the child component? Yes, if you have multiple cascading values, you absolutely can do that. Um, all, the va all of the videos are on YouTube. Martin, check it out. YouTube.com slash dot net. Take a look at the Learn C Sharp with C Sharp Fritz. All of my live streams are on YouTube.com slash C Sharp Fritz. Last thing I wanted to cover was session. If you have session state that you want to pass around, I'm not going to get to local session state, sorry. You want to pass around inside your Blazor application, you can define a class that passes some information. I'm going to pass the current count of my counter here. I can register that with the service locator. Here I registered it as a singleton. You can register it as scoped. Don't register it as transient, but singleton or scoped. And that state, that object, will be passed to you on pages where you request it be injected like right there so when you modify the values that are inside of it it gets stored and passed around and shared with the other application with the rest of the pages in the application so i can um, specify when this increments here um, i can start it right um, i can start the value right uh, I'm not going to be able to do this. It's not, gosh, no. On initialized, yeah. Uh, t async task. No, I don't have enough time. I can fetch that value and set it here. This this sample is not complete. Um, and I can store that value. I can also then say state equals current value. No, it's... Oh no, it is doing it. It is doing it right there. Because it's binding and incrementing current value right there. And it's saying plus equals. So when I go here, increment the counter. Okay, so I've made it 15. Navigate somewhere else and come back. It's fetched it out of state and painted it right there for us. Okay? So that's one way to do state. You can also save state in, in 
browser using local storage. A component that I recommend you check out for that is called, now let's go to uh, NuGet, um, blazard.localstorage. This is from our friend um, Chris Sainty, who makes a bunch of components here, right? Yeah. And this provides a very similar interaction where you can inject local storage here and you can say get items out of local storage or set items on local storage really cool to use blazard.localstorage is the name of that package you can use a static class that's one way to do it um and and just share that and make that available but this is one way that you can do it and it'll save those values into your browser local storage so you can fetch it just like a cookie later um i need to head back over to the other machine we are out of time friends i'll answer one or two more questions before we get out of here as we get out of here because it is 11 o'clock it's been two hours get back to here there we go ah so good um way off topic some of these questions are way off topic at, at this point. Sorry, you can ask questions in the first 40 minutes and I'll do AMA. Um, so, um, it's it's always easy for folks to create their own libraries. Yes, just what you put in with it. So, Rishab, sorry, uh, I'm wrapping up and that is a very deep question. Um, all right, friends, thank you so much for tuning in. I very much appreciate you joining me. But it's time to it's time to time to go. Thank you so much, friends, for tuning in. I will be back next Monday. We'll be talking about more with Blazer. I gotta nail down exactly what the content is for that session. But we'll be chatting and talking through more. And um, I hope you have a fantastic Monday. Um, the end of your Monday, beginning of your Monday, wherever you are, whatever time it might be. Have a fantastic week. Wish you all the best in, in your coding and interactions that you might have. Um, and I will see you tomorrow over on twitch.tv slash C Sharp Fritz. For those of you on YouTube, the archive is available. You can check out links to the source code. It's available just below here on YouTube. If you're watching the, the archive, check out that link. It'll get you right through to the samples that we talked about and showed today. And for those of you on Twitch, let's set up for a raid. Let's connect and, and see who else is streaming on the big Twitch TV network so we can raid them, have a good time learning more about tech somewhere else here on, on channel. Um, they're way early there. I don't know if I'm going to raid her, and it's slightly off topic, but it is good content. Um, you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to I'm going to do it anyway. Um, a friend who's getting ready to talk about tech news, gaming news, streaming news. For those of you on Twitch, I'm going to connect you. This is a first from Visual Studio. I'm going to connect you with Loco. She's a fantastic streamer who knows all about insight for folks that are getting started with live streaming, getting started and talking about the tech, gaming news and what's happening out there. I want you to stick around and, and check out her stream coming up right after the raid here. Thank you so much for watching. All of you on YouTube, take care. Have a fantastic time. And if you're over there on, on Twitch, we'll see you over on Loco's channel in just a second. Take care.